first keynote session of the day. This will be given by Nicolas Burbules, an expert in the philosophy of education and professor at the University of Illinois. He will be introduced by Pablo Aveluto, the Secretary of Culture from the Argentine Ministry of Education, Science and Technology and Culture. Please welcome them to the stage. Buenos días. Es un enorme placer para mí estar aquí esta mañana y es un placer aún mayor estar aquí presentando al profesor Burbules. Eh, al igual que creo que todos ustedes o un altísimo porcentaje, nací en el siglo pasado. Y es importante, me quería hacer una breve, muy breve reflexión histórica para entender de dónde venimos, dónde, en qué mundo nacimos y en qué mundo nos toca vivir ahora. En el siglo en el que nacimos, en la segunda mitad de ese siglo, vivíamos en plena... Guerra Fría, con innumerables interpretaciones acerca del futuro de la humanidad, de nuestra civilización, a, discutiendo no menos teorías acerca del desarrollo y de cómo se iría diseñando la sociedad futura con impacto seguramente sobre la cultura, la educación, los sistemas políticos. En mediados de los años 70, un joven compañero mío, joven, niño, yo soy del 66, ahí estaba en tercero, cuarto grado, trajo una calculadora electrónica al aula y la... Nuestra maestra estaba entre fascinada e indignada porque pensaba que, tal vez con razón, todos los niños en cuanto tuviéramos acceso a las pequeñas calculadoras portátiles dejaríamos de saber sumar, restar, multiplicar y dividir. Al mismo tiempo que la revolución tecnológica fue avanzando sobre cada una de las esferas de nuestra vida social y de nuestra vida personal, fue surgiendo, como suele pasar ante las grandes transformaciones de la humanidad, un pensamiento nostálgico, una idea de que el mundo era mejor antes de que esta revolución sucediera y que de lo que se trataba en distintos ámbitos era de generar una, la mayor distancia posible con ese impacto para mantener la pureza perdida, seguramente, supimos después, imaginaria pureza perdida, imaginaria pureza de, aquel, de aquellas etapas anteriores a esa revolución tecnológica. Aún hoy hay quienes imaginan que hay que impedir que los niños lleguen al aula con sus celulares, algo que no existía cuando la mayoría de nosotros iba a la escuela o era alumno en la secundaria o incluso cuando estaba en la universidad. En esa nostalgia de una suerte de mundo, de un paraíso perdido, es enormemente peligrosa porque la tecnología sigue estando allí, sigue avanzando y mal podemos imaginarnos espacios dentro de nuestra sociedad en los cuales carezcamos de, de su presencia. En ese sentido, 
para mí es enormemente oportuno en este foro donde tantas personas tan prestigiosas, tan relevantes en cada uno de sus países se han reunido para debatir el mundo de las ideas, el mundo del pensamiento y los enormes desafíos que tiene para todos nosotros. Si pudiera decir mi opinión, les diría que el principal desafío es abandonar toda nostalgia de aquello que perdimos. No hay ninguna posibilidad de volver atrás, no hay ninguna posibilidad de inventarnos un, un túnel del tiempo. Tal vez los de mi edad se acuerden de aquella vieja serie de televisión en la cual una pareja, los protagonistas, volvían al pasado con la intención de corregirlo. No podemos hacerlo como no podemos hacerlo con nuestras propias vidas, no podemos volver atrás y, e impedir aquello que ya ocurrió, aquello que está ocurriendo y aquello que está teniendo un em, impacto enorme sobre el modo en el que vivimos, nos relacionamos, pensamos los seres humanos. Quiero presentarles al profesor Nicolás Burbules, que es profesor en el Departamento de Política Educacional, Organización y Liderazgo en la Universidad de Illinois, en Urbana Champaign, en los Estados Unidos de América. Sus áreas principales de investigación son la filosofía y la educación, la enseñanza a través del diálogo, la tecnología. Eh, a lo largo de sus trabajos, el profesor Burbules describió la tecnología como ubicua, Está en todas partes, en tiendas, en colegios, en bibliotecas, en casas. Está siempre con la gente. A más de uno de ustedes les habrá sucedido como me sucede a mí, que si salimos a la calle sin el celular, sin nuestro teléfono móvil, sentimos que estamos saliendo desnudos o que nos estamos perdiendo algo enormemente trascendente. Afirma que necesitamos entender la curiosidad de los jóvenes y ayudarlos a comprender sus elecciones y las consecuencias que ellas tienen. Lleva escritos y publicados más de 16 libros y 200 artículos periodísticos y, y, y capítulos de libros, muchos de ellos traducidos a diversas, a diversas lenguas. Y frecuentemente es invitado para dar conferencias en universidades en distintos lugares del mundo. Actualmente es director de Educación en el Centro Nacional de Ética Profesional y de Investigación en la Universidad de Illinois. Eh, les pido que recibamos con un fuerte aplauso a nuestro, key, a nuestro orador clave de esta mañana, el profesor Burgueles. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in, in Buenos Aires. This is my sixth or seventh time here. Um, uh, I want to I thank, first of all, the organizers of the T20 conference for the invitation to be here as part of this summit. Uh, I specifically want to thank the Ministry of uh, Education, Culture, Science, and Technology, uh, and all the, uh, the, the support staff who have helped to make my visit Uh, really enjoyable and productive. Uh, I specifically want to thank the Minister Alejandro Finocchiaro and also Pablo Avaluto, the Secretary. So, um, so I was told to limit my comments to 18 minutes. Uh, I'm a philosopher. It, ta it takes me 18 minutes to define my terms. Um, but I'm organizing my talk around what I call 10 theses on the future of work and education. So I have 10 points. I'll try to make them directly. Each of them we could talk about for an hour, um, and maybe we'll have some time for questions and answers and discussions after my presentation. So number one, uh, let's begin with the obvious point. Uh, it, it's no longer possible to simply get a degree and then work for the next 30 or 40 years in a particular career. That's not the map of work. Um, for most people today. Jobs are changing, um, some jobs are disappearing, uh, and any job requires ongoing learning and retraining and further development as the nature of the work, the knowledge, the technology around the work changes. Um, 
So uh, in, the, in America, we have a, a process that we call continuing education. It's part of the process of helping people in work and in jobs develop their, their, uh, their skills. Uh, I, I call it continuous education because it's not just a one-time intervention. It's an ongoing, continuous part of the work life itself, and I'll say more about that. So that's the first point. Second point is um, if you look at it this way, then what is the foundation of learning that prepares you for a life of lifelong learning? What are the things that you need to learn in order to be a lifelong learner? Um, I don't think that we think about this uh, enough in educational contexts. Um, but I think one piece of that is learning to engage with technology uh, and the resources and knowledge and uh, uh, opportunities for learning that technology uh, presents uh, in an ongoing and a productive way as part of one's life. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, as Pablo mentioned, I've, I've talked before when I've been here about what I call ubiquitous learning. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept, which is when people have uh, mobile devices, they carry the internet in their pocket, uh, they have pervasive wire wireless connectivity. Learning can become an anywhere, anytime opportunity. It isn't just limited to the formal context in institutions of education. Um, I think learning was always an anywhere, anytime opportunity, but the technologies available now make structured and organized learning opportunities available wherever where one is located, including in the workplace. Um, so, this is the third point. As learning becomes more ubiquitous, it becomes more situated, more problem-based, and more social. I, I could say a lot more about those three elements, but learning that is situated, problem-based, and social looks different from much of the learning that goes on in our formal educational institutions. But when learning is happening in locations where one actually is using and applying that knowledge or those skills, uh, it, it has this different quality or character of learning. Um, so a question that I want to ask is how do we take advantage of these, these features of situated problem-based social learning and thinking about different ways and new ways of teaching uh, familiar and also new knowledge and skills? Um, I think a lot about the motivational structures in learning. Why do we tell students they need to learn certain kinds of things? Uh, and our typical answer in schools is some version of learn it now, use it later. Or if we're honest, learn it now, maybe use it later. Or learn it now, I don't know if you'll ever use it later. But you have to learn it now. That's not a great motivational structure. And so learning which is engaged much more in the context in which that learning will be used and applied creates a different kind of motivational structure. You could call it just-in-time learning, but it's much more related to the context in which that knowledge is needed, those skills are needed, and they're actually going to be used and applied. Um, my fourth point uh, is that I think we need to think about learning um, and work as a lifelong arc. Uh, and there's an important element that, we, that doesn't get talked about enough, which is the life that one has after work. More and more, as lifespans grow, as people's health is better, the period of life after you've finished working gets longer and longer. It can be 20 years or more than 20, 20 years for some people. What are the learning opportunities and needs for that period of life? We talk about lifelong learning, but we don't talk very much about that last period of people's lives. Um, and I think that there's important questions after work ends. What, what should be the learning goals for this period? How do we think about this process of learning as a continuous arc across the, the entire uh, span of a person's life? And specifically, what makes post-work life productive and worthwhile? Uh, I think many people deal with the challenge of no longer working, um, something that they might have been very meaningful, very much part of their identity. It's taken away from them now. Uh, what, what replaces that? Uh, and how can education support and prepare people for that period of life? Um, fifth point, uh, new media, social networking, 
sharing, a culture of sharing and shared knowledge and collaboration are also part of this changing work environment. Um, how do we help students learn to participate in this? I think in the current environment, a lot of what young people and the students learn about uh, new media, social networking, sharing, collaboration, they actually learn outside of school um, in their interactions online and in virtual communities um, and in other networked environments. Are schools keeping up with this changing culture uh, that we see? I see a lot of young people in the audience. You know this better than I do. I see it in my son. Uh, his relationship to technology, his relationship to other people mediated through technology just looks very different. Um, than I think some of our traditional models of learning. Uh, and I'm not sure schools are keeping up with that new context. Uh, point number six, um, the relationship of learning to work is also changing. And I've already touched on this. I'll say a little bit more about this. Um, our approach used to be first learn, then do. Um, learning is seen as the preparation for the real activity that you're being prepared for, whether it's work or citizenship uh, or other aspects of life. Not everything is about work. Um, but rather thinking now about learning and relearning um, as part of the flow of work life itself, as part of the flow of life itself. Uh, in the first uh, paper that I wrote on ubiquitous learning, I had an expression that I, I really liked. I'll use it again. To be is to learn. Uh, it's part of life to be a learner. You don't finish your learning and then start life. The learning continues and follows through. So that's a slogan, that's a line. But how does that actually work? And specifically, how does technology, especially mobile and portable technology, support this, uh, this, this, this pattern of ongoing learning and relearning, woven into the flow of work, woven into the flow of life and life's activities? Uh, again, not only work, but citizenship, parenting, uh, and all, art, culture, uh, travel, all the other things that are part of life, uh, part of a complete life, during and again, as I said, after the cycle of work is over. Seven, a, a key part of this, it seems to me, um, is setting personal goals and self-direction, taking responsibility for your learning. Uh, that's a key part of being a lifelong learner. It isn't just a question of overt structures of support or, mot again, motivation that structure and guide and motivate what you are, are going to learn, but taking responsibility into adulthood to drive and develop your own learning. Uh, what does it mean to do that? And how do you learn to do that? Um, some of this is in response to changing work demands and opportunities. Some of it is in response to one's changing interests as a person, the things you care about and want to do when you're 30 or 40 or 60 years old are not the same as what you want to do when you're 18 years old. Um, and life, as I've said a couple times now, goes through different kinds of phases. Education's not all about work, but how does learning support the, the, the how does one take responsibility for learning that supports uh, and helps to drive this changing pattern of development and growth over the course of one's life. Um, one piece of this, this is point number eight, is what we call in English metacognition. That is, the ability to reflect on and understand and think about your own processes of thinking, your own processes of learning. Um, there's a lot of evidence that metacognition and developing metacognitive skills is a really crucial part of educational success. Uh, but I want to move meta metacognition uh, out of the formal structure of education into this other pattern that I'm calling this ongoing, continuous flow of learning in one's life. Uh, the skills of metacognition are necessary here. Understanding what you know, understanding what you don't know, understanding what you need to know or want to know, understanding how you learn and how to manage and direct your own learning when there isn't necessarily a teacher there to direct and guide and motivate you uh, is a crucial part of what it means to be a lifelong learner. Um, and, uh, and as I've said now a couple of times, we think, need to think about the development of the lifelong learner as itself an educational goal. Um, I'll say more about that also in just a second. 
Number nine, obviously technology is a means of diversifying and customizing learning to these changing opportunities, needs, interests over the course of one's life. I call this multimodal instruction. I talked about this last night. Maybe some of you were at the talk last night. I'm not going to repeat that lecture here. But we need to develop and think about and manage different pathways of learning that fit the different needs and interests and ways of learning for different learners. Um, we need to move past an approach of what I call a one-size-fits-all approach to teaching and learning. And as a person is learning to take uh, responsibility for and to direct and guide their own learning, part again of this, is pro of this metacognitive process is realizing what kinds of learning strategies work for oneself in order to take control and direct it. And finally, um, number 10, the workplace itself. The changing workplace needs to become itself uh, an, a learning environment. Um, uh, I think part of this is for learning environments to more, be more closely networked with other learning environments. And in my field, I will say especially universities. Um, I'm looking at this more from the university side. I've been pushing for several years now the idea at my university and other places that we regard our relationship with our students as also a lifelong relationship. That at graduation, instead of saying goodbye, good luck, have a great career, we say something different. We say, we want to be part of your life. We want an ongoing relationship with you throughout your work life, and as I've said, and beyond. You will always be a student of this university. You will always be a member of this knowledge network and learning community. And we want to continue a relationship with you formally and informally throughout the course of your life. What does it mean for universities on their side to offer that kind of ongoing lifelong relationship? And what does it mean for people who are in the workplaces uh, and other environments to participate in and make those connections and links productive for people? Um, the issue here is not only technological. It requires developing a spirit uh, or ethos in the workplace of learning, collaboration, incentive structures, and opportunities to learn built into the structure of work activities. Not as an add-on, but as part of that flow. I like that word flow, where working, learning, doing new work or doing better work is an ongoing, iterative, cyclical process and not the sort of linear process that we've often uh, thought of it as being first learn, then work. That model doesn't work anymore, or maybe it never worked, uh, but we really need to rethink it now. So those are my 10 points. Uh, I'm looking forward to Pablo's comments. I'm looking forward to comments and questions from you. Thank you again. My first question, mi oh, primera sure. pregunta. Okay. Well, I, I will speak in, in Spanish. Okay, great. I feel more sure. Okay. Eh, mi primera pregunta es, ¿cómo se produce, okay. cómo se produce o cómo puede producirse estas transformaciones que estás señalando entre este estado de algún modo eh, eh, congelado de la educación previa al, al, a la ubicuidad de la tecnología o de la información a esta nueva propuesta que, que nos estás contando. Sure. Um, okay, uh, so I won't begin another lecture, but I'll make some comments about that. <laughs> One is, uh, I think teachers need to change. I think need teachers need to uh, think differently about their work. Um, uh, I said this last night, maybe some of you heard this. Um, I think one of the things that I've been hearing now about technology and education for um, at least 30 years uh, is that computers are going to replace teachers. Uh, and I know that there are teachers who are concerned. Uh, we see it certainly in other occupations that jobs are disappearing uh, as robots or AI take on the activities and work uh, that used to be done by human beings. Um, uh, that's a real problem, uh, and the consequences of people's lives who suddenly their job no longer exists uh, is, I think, a real problem for society, not only Argentina, but the U.S. and everywhere around the world. Uh, is there a danger of that happening to teachers? I, I personally don't think so. 
um, or at least I don't think ne necessarily so. I think it's within teachers' control to become even more relevant in the context of technology-based learning. I think that teachers can develop a central role, an indispensable role, as live, knowledgeable, skilled human beings to be part of the process that helps students to navigate the world of technology-based learning, both inside and outside yeah. the classroom in the school. Uh, so there, but there are things that are necessary for that to happen. One is, I think teachers need to change the ways they think about teaching and learning changing them from the ways in which maybe they were trained initially as teachers, certainly different from the ways in which they learned when they were students in schools. I've tried to go through some of this even myself. I'm older. Uh, but I think teachers need to be willing to change and even give up certain assumptions about what teaching and learning is. It's changing. Uh, and again, I won't turn this into another lecture, but what I'm calling multimodal teaching and learning is one of the ways in which I think it's changing. Um, second, uh, the second main point is I think that teachers need to see their roles more in terms of partnerships. Uh, if I'm right, if I'm right that ubiquitous learning is a networked, distributed system of learning within both formal and informal learning contexts, you know, traditionally in education we define formal education and informal education as two different spheres of activity. Part of my argument is that that, that distinction is blurring. Uh, and that learning opportunities now extend about, across both formal and informal contexts. So one challenge for teachers is to see these other contexts as opportunities to extend the learning of the classroom out into other spaces and to take learning that's happening in those other spaces, the home, the workplace, the online virtual community, the coffee house, uh, whatever it is, and bring that external learning as a resource into the classroom. So it, it means both seeing the school and these other places as networked with each other through mobile technologies, portable technologies, but also to see the participants in these other venues, parents, employers, uh, other people in other places, uh, participants in, again, in online or social media spaces as partners, partners to them in developing a broad and inclusive and effective learning environment. That's not the way teachers have traditionally thought about their role. Um, when I first started in this business, the classic idea was the teacher went in their classroom, they closed the door, and that was their kingdom. That was their domain, and they controlled everything that went on there. That obviously isn't possible anymore. It isn't possible when the students have phones with them. It isn't possible when students are looking out the window or thinking about something that they read online or they're looking forward to catching up on their uh, Facebook page or whatever. Uh, the, the, the physical boundaries of the classroom are not the teacher's domain anymore. Uh, and that's a radical change. But if teachers are prepared to respond to those changes, as I've said before, I think teachers can be even more important to the learning process, but their role is changing. They're mediators and facilitators more than the controllers of knowledge and learning. Long answer. Thank you. Probablemente, o para muchos, las evaluaciones fueron claves durante el periodo industrial, cómo certificar que alguien sabía aquello que se consideraba necesario para un trabajo o para concluir una etapa de su formación. ¿Crees que eso también va a cambiar o está en un proceso de cambio? ¿Cómo evaluamos y certificamos el conocimiento de las personas? Sí, yeah, uh, great question. Um, I don't think testing is going to go away. Uh, and I think that testing does serve some important purposes in terms of evaluating or providing feedback, especially to the institution, about whether they're being effective. I think we sometimes think that the test scores are a measure to the students. Okay. I think we should think more of test scores as a measure to the institution. Yeah. Uh, and if the, students are if the students are failing the test, uh, somebody is failing, I'm not sure it's the student. Um, that, that's the first point. Uh, I also think, yes, in terms of what I've been talking about, we need to have assessments that are, I mean, a test is a specific assessment at a particular point in time. And this idea of what I'm talking about is learning as an ongoing and continuous process requires other ways of assessing effectiveness. And one major assessment will be the ways in which that learning is being used in the workplace or other places. And if it's being used effectively, 
That's the sign of success. Um, uh, and uh, that, does, again, requires a rethinking of what learning is for. Learning is not for performing well on tests, uh, although sometimes we think that way and we talk that way. That's not what learning is for. That, that's never what learning was for, but it's certainly not what learning is for today. Te voy a pedir que se lo digas a mi madre. Muchas gracias, estamos en, <laughs> en tiempo. <laughs> en, en, y quiero agradecerle muchísimo al profesor Burbules. Espero que haya sido de interés para ustedes esta intervención y simplemente eh, que sigamos continuando con las actividades del T20. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.